Sing till the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing till the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Jesus, Jesus, how I love thee. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing till the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Christ Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Jesus, Jesus, how I love thee. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing till the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing till the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Fill me up, come my Holy Spirit. Fill me up to the top of my soul. Filling me up, come the Holy Spirit. Filling me up now and take control. Filling me up, come the Spirit, come. Filling me up, Holy Spirit, go. Coming things try to fill me up. Filling me up, come the Spirit, come. So many things try to weigh me down. Filling me up, come the Holy Spirit, come. Come, my heart, flow until you stay. Fill me up, come, my spirit, come, and chase the other things away. Fill my heart, come, spirit, fill me up, come, the Holy Spirit. Fill me up, come, the top of my soul. Fill me up, come, the Holy Spirit. Fill me up now and take control. Fill me up, come, the Holy come. Fill me up, Holy Spirit, oh. Come, my heart is an open door. Fill me up, come, the Spirit, come. Fill your Spirit is welcome, Lord. Fill me up, come, the Holy Spirit, come. my heart flow and let it grow. Fill me up, come, the Spirit, come. Change my life so I will know. Fill my heart, you come and fill me up, come, the Holy Spirit. Spirit, fill me up, come the top of my soul. Fill me up, come the Holy Spirit. Fill me up now and take control. Fill me up now and take control. Fill up my heart, come Spirit. Fill me up, fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up. I dreamed of rain, and the rains came, soft and easy, sweet and clear. I dreamed of rain, and the rains came, and peace spread over the land. I dreamed of summer, and the winds changed, and the green was easy, and the rivers ran clear. I dreamed of summer, and the winds changed, and peace spread over the land. And the flowers bloomed in the desert, and the air is fresh and clear. Rain and the rains came, and peace 
spread over the land. I dreamed of freedom and the moon rose, and the way was easy and the path was clear. I dreamed of freedom and the moon rose and peace spread over the land and the garden stars are shining and the night is bright and clear I dreamed of freedom and the spread over the land. I dreamed of heaven and the earth sang, and the sound was easy, the song was clear. I dreamed of heaven and the earth sang, and peace spread over the Forgotten, and the Father's debts are clear. I dreamed of heaven and the earth was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see Jesus Jesus how I love thee shout hallelujah praise his
My mask is stuck. <laughs> Who can undo me? <laughs> stuck on your microphone, I know. One of the perils of uh, hearing aids, masks, glasses, and uh, microphones. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Happy Halloween. <laughs> all saints, all souls, etc. So, uh, we have a few announcements today. Welcome. Welcome to Robbinsdale Parkway. It's good to have you, Robbinsdale Parkway, and good to have you online. Um, we have a few announcements today. One is next Saturday is Cherish the Church. That is when at 8 o'clock there's breakfast, all church breakfast, for those who want to come, and people are spaced quite far apart. Um, that's downstairs in Fellowship Hall. And then at 9 o'clock, other people can come who don't want to do breakfast, and we have tasks. You sign up for the tasks that you want to do. Dusting, changing light bulbs, uh, sanitizing toys in the nursery, breaking leaves. There's a list, and you sign up for what you will do, and you do it, and then afterwards maybe there's pizza or something, and we're kind of done around noon typically. So um, we need people to help with that, and it's a fun kind of community-building occasion. Um, secondly, I've been asked to talk about the loose change jar because not everyone knows about this. This church has a tradition of assigning loose change, meaning pocket change, once a month to a different charity. So there will be a jar out here, and this month for October was for St. Anne's Place, which is a shelter in Minneapolis for women and children, and it's a slightly confusing because Nancy Larson will make an announcement later about we provide Thanksgiving dinner for them. And so there are additional contributions we're looking for for St. Anne's Place in November. But the jar was for St. Anne's Place through today in October, and then next month we start another charity that we put our loose change into. All right, so it's not the same things as your pledge, it's just a loose change can, and that'll typically be out here. Um, secondly, or secondly, another thing is bonfires are happening. So today the bonfire's at six o'clock, here in the parking lot with T. Michael and several of the youth and children, and they'll be providing treats for people trick-or-treating who decide to come. So that will be fun. Um, next Saturday, Bill and Bill and Salt and Bill, where are you, Bill? He's not here yet. Okay, are um, hosting a bonfire at their home in Brooklyn Center. They can take like eight people. And the following Saturday, the second Saturday of November, Justin and Henry are hosting a bonfire at their place in Golden Valley, which is over by Cub and 100. So, and they can take a certain number of people. So if you would like to attend one of those bonfires, please let me know, because I'm keeping track of, we've, so we've got the right number of people at each. Or if you decide you'd like to host an additional one, um, let me know that as well. Then the green team is meeting for the first time November 7th. That will be next Saturday. It'll be um, hybrid here and on Zoom. And that is, we will determine the focus of that as we go. Everybody thinks it's a good idea that we want to do it, but will it be making um, our church zero waste, for instance? Will it be working in the local community, claiming adopting a drain and making those clear and moving ahead in the local community? Or will it be advocating for things bigger than that? And that will be determined by the people who are there. So that's 11.45 next Sunday. Also, there's an excellent book I've heard by Jane Goodall, the woman who worked with gorillas, um, called Hope. And I wanted to read it simply because it sounded like it was really a great book about hope. But Carol told me that um, her friend had said it also has great ideas for the environment. And so that's something that, regardless if you're interested in the green team, you may want to pick up and read and uh, discuss or bring your ideas. All right, other announcements. Please come on up and introduce yourself and tell them. I'm to talk to you about St. Anne's Place and their Thanksgiving dinner. This is the 21st year that, that our church has paid for and or personally bought all the groceries for their dinner, and then we ask that that we get between eight and eight, nine, or ten homemade pies, and I bring them down there the day before Thanksgiving. 
Now, last year, because of the pandemic, um, we did, they did the grocery shopping. We gave, we gave them gift cards from, um, from what we collected here. And I'm thinking maybe we will again. I don't necessarily want to go grocery shopping um, for that big a group right now. But anyway, if you could um, put your donations in an envelope and mark them, thanks, Thanksgiving. That's all you have to do. That's all the description they need. And uh, we hope to raise between four and five hundred dollars for their groceries, because um, they do have family. They they can invite some family there and staff, and so they usually have about um, about between fifty and sixty people that have Thanksgiving together. Thank you. And Nancy, excuse me, if you want to bake a pie, what do you tell you that, or do we sign up somewhere, or what? Oh, I forgot to say that. There's a, there's a pie sign-up sheet right around the corner on the bulletin board, kind of across from the, uh, from the door to the office. And uh, usually, usually we, we ask for apple, sweet potato, and pumpkin pie. That seems to be the, the favorites. And I will meet you, there's a description of that, but I will meet you in the parking lot the day before Thanksgiving. And I'll call you and tell you exactly what time I'll be here. Does that sound everything? Sounds good. Does Thank it you. sound good? Wonderful. Thank you. Well, hello, Cordelia. Anything new going on with you today? <laughs> I'm living into my witch self. I think some of you didn't get the memo that today is Halloween, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I will have a different hat for tonight, so just saying. Um, you might want to come to the bonfire. Um, so October is, I think, a made-up hallmark month of pastor appreciation. Oh. And um, I was hoping to do some something bigger, but... I didn't. So, um, but I have a few presents for our pastors in appreciation of their work. Oh. And um, if you have appreciations for them, I think uh, November and December and January, February, March, April, May, uh, just pick a month <laughs> and uh, send them a card or uh, give them a book that you um, think they will love. And these are some uh, one is a brand new book by a friend of mine, and um, the other is an older book um, on theology. So, uh, here you go. Thank well, you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you very much. Cool. There is nothing pastors like as much as books, so this is great. This is for us to share. Thank you. No, 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 no. That's right. That's right. <laughs> It is addressed to both of us, so we will, we will fight over this later. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Greg Mertz, um, and now I feel really bad that I didn't bring presents for anybody. I, <laughs> maybe, maybe next time. Uh, I think most of you have probably heard of Isaiah. Uh, if you haven't, what Isaiah is, it's a nonprofit, um, faith-based group that advocates for progressive causes. And Isaiah is on November 13th um, doing a meeting by Zoom to help uh, particularly suburban voters organize for the caucuses that will be happening after the first of the year. So if you have any interest in that or would like to hear more about it, I'll be in the Heritage Hall for a little while after our service. Thank you. I'd also like to just um, point out an excellent thing that happened with Greg Mertz. Uh, he's a lawyer and has been working for many years with a gentleman from where? Ethiopia, who came with his two children but had adopted in Ethiopia his niece because uh, the mother died. But unfortunately in Ethiopia there are not paperworks when you adopt somebody, you just take them. And so that person was not allowed to come to the United States, that little girl. And so they, he, Greg worked very hard for how many years? Three years, and they just got the child. We all make a difference. Uh, just a reminder that Pilgrim Guild is going to be on November 9th. That's a week from Tuesday. And, uh, uh, huh? Oh, I'm Jan Paulson. 
Here, right here. And tell us what Pilgrim Guild is too, for people who are starting out again. Pilgrim Guild, is it, it's very old, but you don't have to be old to come. Uh, just free, and um, we get together uh, at noon. Uh, we have host hosts, hostesses um, that bring dessert. We have coffee, tea, if that's your persuasion. And um, we have some, you know, usually a very short business meeting. Uh, lately, we don't have any money, so it isn't a long business meeting. <laughs> And uh, and then we have some sort of a program. Sometimes it's just uh, getting to know each other better. Uh, so you're all all welcome to come. And it's uh, not this Tuesday, next Tuesday, right? Yeah, I'm I'm only doing this because I'm going to be gone for a week. Ah, uh -huh. okay. But it's and it's in Fellowship Hall, so we can spread tables apart farther. All right. Do they need to tell anybody, or they just come? If you think about it, tell Keith Smith, the guy over here in the yellow. And uh, if you think about it at the last moment, you can still come. Dawn Carlson Khan, and I was just sitting here and realized that the wood slats have been put on the uh, railings. Ooh. And who helped you, T? Um, they're not here. They're just in the garden. Say that again. Okay, but they're in process, and we can see what what it would look like. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Lloyd. Um, many of you might remember, or would not remember, but I was reminded this morning, um, what, 30 years ago was the big Halloween snowstorm, correct? <laughs> and I actually was on a plane that night coming back from... Um, Colorado, where our son and daughter were living at the time, but it was also um, when we learned that our granddaughter, who at that time was two, would be put on the liver transplant list, and so I'm just, it's kind of a reminder that 30 years ago, our granddaughter was given, five, five months later than that, um, a new life, and she is doing well, and of course, many, some of you may know that they have two children, and right now they're living in California. So it's kind of a celebration for the Lloyds. Okay, Any, oh, I'm sorry, Justin, please. Actually, that's kind of him and kind of us too. And I appreciate the fact that Justin's wearing his, um, his name tag, so just as a little reminder, <laughs> this is our blessing. it's helpful. We're gonna, we're gonna bless Justin. Oh, great. So, um, you, you know, <laughs> I got to inform Kathy sometimes when I think of things. Um, but uh, so Justin is on his way uh, tomorrow, right, yeah. um, to El Salvador uh, with a group of UCC folks who are doing um, some relationship building and, and, and mission work uh, in this place. And so we're just, we want to bless you and thank you for representing us as a wider church as well. Um, going with a very good friend from California, I think, um, as well. So, um, but uh, yeah, let's have a prayer and then we'll move into joys Great. and concerns. Okay. So, um, yeah, that'd be good. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for our global partnerships, for people of other cultures to teach us and help us to grow. We bless Justin and all of the team that is heading to El Salvador to have open hearts and kind faces and represent us in a way that inspires and enriches and shows a deep sense of compassion. Our hearts, our spirits, our love, our support go with you and may you return safely to us and with new stories to tell. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. That's our, our second joy, right? That was the, the first joy was Kathy Lloyd's. Um, so, uh, ongoing joys and concerns, prayers for our community. Um, we're always holding in, in prayer those who are heading out to the polls this week in Minneapolis and St. Paul. There's some contentious things in the ballots, and, and our hearts are breaking for uh, peace neighbors who are fighting against each other in the midst of all this, including the ongoing violence on the north side. So, lots of joys and concerns um, in the midst of that. 
We bring to our awareness all the time the reality that we're uh, standing on Dakota land and, and our hearts are broken with the broken people who are displaced um, from the land that is theirs. So that too, uh, Lori has a joy or a concern besides the boot on her leg. Yeah, the boot's fine. Um, so I'm Lori Myron and uh, I'm just concerned about COVID. And I work in care facilities and we've been having an uptick again and more people dying and Lily isn't here today because her facility is shut down because of a COVID. Um, so just continued prayers for that and for people to get vaccinated and to get boosters if when they can. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. Sharing a concern that Kathy shared last week, um, but our prayers are with Jane and Pete Williams. Um, uh, lots of prayers for you in this time as well. So please keep uh, the Williams family in your prayers. Um, I want to lift up uh, Pope Francis this morning did an address in um, the lead up to the big environmental summit in Scotland. Um, that basically, he, in his beautiful way, uh, in Latin, I can't, I'm not going to repeat it in Latin, but the English translation was, um, blessed are you who listen to the poor and listen to the earth. And may that transform us all. So blessings for Pope Francis. It was a beautiful thing. Um, I wish I could do it in Latin, but I can't. Um, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. <laughs> uh, I could Carol, do it in Latin. You're right, if I had more practice. Carol Anderson. Uh, so there's a couple online requests. Uh, Kristen Sanquist, prayers for my grandson's uncle Eric struggling in ICU with COVID. And then Rebecca Watry, um, a friend from Kathy and I's previous parish, prayers for Jim's cousin-in-law who died this week of COVID. Lisa Stressner also asked prayers, ongoing prayers for her Uncle John. Um, and so please keep those folks in your prayers as well. And Cordelia has yet another thing. Yet so, another thing, sorry. Uh, uh, there's not a second present, though? No. Well, there was two presents in the... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, so today is Halloween, and about 10 years ago, I had no idea that the next day I would meet my baby. And so November 1st, tomorrow, is the um, anniversary of the day that I got the phone call to go to the hospital and meet a 10-day-old baby that um, was meant to be um, a part of our family. And so we give thanks for that, it's a very busy uh, birthday. Uh, God found us you kind of few weeks, um, but she was 10 days old and three and a half pounds and um, not necessarily having good uh, potential outcomes. And now she is the smartest girl in school. So, um, <laughs> and the most, and the nicest and <laughs> kindest and most amazing friend. So um, thank you, God, for that. And, and just to lift up a prayer for all of those families who um, will get that similar call, that there is a child to foster or adopt or both, and, um, and that they might find strength and lots of love and that all the children in the foster system are, um, are loved. Thanks. Amen. A birthday for all of you. Indeed. Um, and other joys and concerns that we can share. Uh, then I will close by saying it's my joy that uh, November 1st was my first day um, uh, 15 years ago at Robbinsdale Parkway. So um, that's, that's my joy and, uh, and my family's as well. So thank you so much. Um, let us gather our hearts and minds ready for this amazing worship. Oh, we
If you are able, please stand and join me in the call to worship. Hear, O family, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We love the Lord with our God, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. We love our neighbor as ourselves. ourselves. There is no commandment greater than these. A poem, a love poem, by St. Catherine of Siena, a peasant before a king. If I did not understand the glory and suffering of the human heart, I would not speak before its holiness, like a peasant called before a great king, when all of his court is assembled. That is how I stand before every woman and man, how is it that God seeks our counsel whenever a voice or face asks of us? What a sweet divine game God plays. I stand with humility before every creature when they call me into their court. Because of your holiness, my dears.
Children's time. Anybody? That's okay, Edward. That's fine. B's going to come up a little bit close. I wonder what B is for Halloween. <laughs> a red fox, aren't you? Or a brown fox? Would it, do you know which one? What? Just a fox. You have an accent, too. The fox is a different voice. That's so cool. I love that. Are you going to do that for Halloween ever? What are you going to be? Do you, <laughs> Mom doesn't know. A firefighter. A firefighter. Okay, cool. Anybody else dressing up for Halloween? Oh, hey, Isaac. You going to dress up? No. Yeah, what are you going to be? I don't know. Don't know yet? Kind of last minute or no? Okay. You just got to figure it out. Mom's going to help you? Cool. Well, what's, what's, uh, what's Grant going to be for Halloween? What? Oh, he has a costume. You've, worn a, you've already worn a bunch of stuff. But you know what to tell us? It's a secret? Okay, it's a secret. <laughs> That's fine. That's okay. Well, what's, what's Grant going to be for Halloween? A soldier. Union or, or um, uh, Confederate? <laughs> Okay, well, we'll just leave that a surprise too, right? No judgments, by the way. Okay, there's lots of judgments, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so one of the things that we dress up like sometimes, which I think is important, is um, th there's, a, there's a scripture passage about dressing up like, like you're a person of faith. Dressing up like a Christian. And they put on the helm of salvation and the breastplate of truth and boots that will make help you walk to different places and spread the journey, right? So you kind of dress up as a, so, I, so I wonder, like, when we look in the mirror sometimes, do we wear and experience the, the right costume to show up for church? Now, back in the day, people dressed up for church, like really dressed up, like really, really, really dressed up. We have pictures in the ar archives, and, and every uh, person identified as male wore a black suit and a, and a white shirt. Everybody. And, and all of the f folks who were women were, were, had hats on and white gloves. Every one of them. Like that's dressing up for church, right? Why, do you think, why don't you think we do that anymore? Why don't we dress up for Halloween every day? Go ahead, B. Yeah, because we didn't want to anymore, right? Have our own decisions? Well, one of the great things is that we actually are different people in every generation. And so we dress differently depending on what generation we're in. And that's, a, that's always been the case. And it's not about someone was better or someone's worse, but, it, but part of what Scripture is, what, what we do in church, is different in every generation. Because someday you're going to be the leaders and it's going to be your church, right? And you can tell us kind of how to, what to do and how, how we're going to behave. And that's, a, that's an awesome thing about church is it really is kind of this microcosm of the wider culture that sometimes we have to remember that it changes in every generation what we wear. And so, so what we, our costumes are different too, right? Your costumes are probably going to be way better than the costumes I had when I was a kid, right? We had some pretty weird costumes when I was a kid, right? We all dressed up like Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. 
It's true. Right? I went as Frida Kahlo to like five different Halloween things. Because that's, you know, because why not, right? She was amazing. What? High five. High five? All right. High five to Frida Kahlo. Right? So, so I mean, that's part of what, what dressing up is like, is trying on new things for a new time and place. And so it's a wonderful way to spread your wings or your tails or your fuzzy ears and make life happen. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to dress up, to play, to imagine who you call us to be. Amen. Go play. Woo. I like it. You go shake, <laughs> shake the, you gotta shake the tail. Oh, Jody's ready. Go, go, go. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jody Walters, and I've been asked to talk about stewardship. Bernard and I joined Parkway UCC in 1994. After the death of my 12-year-old nephew, I realized my beliefs were a hodgepodge of Christian teachings, having been confirmed at Gethsemane Lutheran, Buddhist philosophy, which I found appealing, and some deeply spiritual experiences, experiences I feel fortunate to have had. Bernard had been attending a Baptist church, but we wanted to worship together. Our search for a church home took us to a few churches that turned out not to be good fits. There's nothing like it when you do find the right church, and the friends you make there are unsurpassed. The support in good times and bad is so amazing and well, I just feel kind of sorry for people who don't have it. They literally don't know sometimes what they are missing. Bernard has been to funerals where the family has no one to even offer a prayer. He has been asked to do so, and luckily he can do that. We have had many hospitalizations in our family and have experienced the deaths of many family members and Bernard has lost many friends. Having a church home is a source of constant comfort. We've served on many different boards and committees and learned a lot, a lot, and learned a lot along the way. The music ministry is now our main focus. We have participated in it for many years and have had many wonderful experiences as a result. So, we choose to support the church with our time and talents, as well as financially as we are able. We feel that it is, a worth what, that it is worthwhile personally and also beneficial for society in so many ways. I hope you will also choose to dedicate some part of your budget and time toward ensuring your own continued enjoyment of worship and also to support the good work the church does. We are all blessed. Thank you. Today we have two scriptures, first from the, uh, the Hebrew, the book of Ruth, chapters one through 18 of uh, chapter one, verses one through 18. This is a familiar story to uh, many people. Once upon a time, it was back in the days when judges led Israel, there was a famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem and Judah left home to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. His sons were named Malan and Kilion, all Ephratites from Bethlehem and Judah. They all went to the country of Moab and settled there. Elimelech died and Naomi was left, she and her two sons. The sons took Moabite wives. The name of the first was Orpah, the second Ruth. 
They lived there in Moab for the next 10 years. But then the two brothers, Malon and Kilion, died. Now the woman was left without either her young men or her husband. One day she got herself together, she and her two daughters, to leave the country of Moab and set out for home. She had heard that God had been pleased to visit his people and give them food. And so she started out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters, or daughters-in-law, with her on the road back to the land of Judah. After a short while on the road, Naomi told her two daughters-in-law, Go back! Go home and live with your mothers, and may God treat you as graciously as you treated your deceased husbands and me. May God give each of you a new home and a new husband. And she kissed them, and they cried openly. They said, No, we're going on with you to your people. But Naomi was firm. Go back, my dear daughters. Why would you come with me? Do you suppose that I still have sons in my womb who can become your future husbands? Go back, dear daughters. On your way, please. I'm too old to get a husband. Why, even if I said, there's still hope, and this very night got a man and had sons, can you imagine being satisfied to wait until they were grown? Would you wait that long to get married again? No, dear daughters, this is a bitter pill for me to swallow, more bitter for me than for you. God has dealt me a hard blow. Again, they cried openly. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth embraced her and held on. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law is going back home to live with her own people and gods. Go with her. But Ruth said, don't force me to leave you. Don't make me go home. Where you go, I go. And where you live, I'll live. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, I'll die. That's where I'll be buried. So help me, God, not even death itself is going to come between us. When Naomi saw that Ruth had her heart set on going with her, she gave in. And so the two of them traveled on together to Bethlehem. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34 and it discusses the greatest commandment. One of the religion scholars came up, hearing the lively exchanges of question and answer and seeing how sharp Jesus was in his answers, he put, it in, he put in his question, which is most important of all the commandments? Jesus said, the first in importance is, listen Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And here is the second. Love others as well as you love yourself. There is no other commandment that ranks with these. The religion scholar said, a wonderful answer, teacher, so clear cut and accurate that God is one and there is no other. And loving him with all passion and intelligence and energy and loving others as well as you love yourself. Why, that's better than all offerings and sacrifices put together. When Jesus realized how insightful he was, he said, you're almost there, right on the border of God's kingdom. After that, no one dared ask a question. Here ends the reading from God's word. Thank you, Jim. I decided to read up here today just for something new, and I have a little more information in my um, sermon today than I often want to memorize, so I thought I'd put it down. So Naomi and her family were strangers in a strange land. They traveled from Israel to the land of the Moabites, which was ancient enemy territory. They did it because they were starving like many immigrants today. They were search of a better life. But then exactly what they were trying to avoid happened anyway. After about 10 years, Naomi's husband died, and so did both of her sons. This story is like a female Job. All of her biological relatives died, leaving her as a stranger 
with foreigners who are ancient enemies of her people. And she felt like Job, too. She told her daughter-in-laws, the hand of the Lord has turned against me. And a couple verses after the verse that Jim read today, it says that she returned to Bethlehem and when she did with Ruth, and when she did, her neighbors and friends in Bethlehem said, is this Naomi? And the word Naomi means pleasant, like they hadn't seen her for a long time. Is this Naomi coming back from the dead? But she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because Mara means bitter. For God has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but God has brought me back empty. Don't call me Naomi, because God has dealt harshly with me and has brought calamity upon me. All right, then. This woman was immersed in what she saw as great hardship, and it was great hardship. When she decided to go back to Bethlehem in Israel, her two daughter-in-laws thought they'd go with her, but as Jim read, Naomi encouraged them to stay because what was she going to offer them at this point in her life? There was no financial security at all for a widow. Both of these women were also Moabites, which were enemies. And here they are coming back with her to enemy territory. It would be like inviting a person from an invading country to come live with you in the country that they just invaded. They would be endangered, and Naomi's life would not be a piece of cake either. They should stay at home, get remarried, and build a new life for themselves. So Orpah says, okay, but that's where Ruth's words take on a new meaning. And these are written into songs and readings that are often at weddings, but this is not a romantic, frosting on the cake kind of a story or phrase that Ruth is saying. Listen to it again with that idea that she's moving away from everything she knows and into the midst of enemy territory. She says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, that's where I'll live. Your people will not be my enemies anymore, but instead will become my people, and your God will be my God too. This is her commitment to immerse herself in a very hard situation. She didn't probably know the language. The fruits were odd. The smells and sights were odd. Their customs are different, and their God is different. And people would always look at her as someone who was untrustworthy, dangerous, and of no value as a person with no human dignity. And instead, she still says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, that's where I'll live. My enemies will become my people now, and your God will be my God. Was this because she was strongly and deeply committing herself to love her mother-in-law with that love that Jesus spoke about today? Was it because the famine in Moab was so bad that she thought she'd die there anyway, and so she was choosing more life? Was it because she was a risky person? Was it because of something bigger and deeper calling her to a fuller life than what she knew in Moab. In Deuteronomy, God says, Today I set before you life and death, a blessing and a curse. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. No matter what the reason, she made a choice for life and love, love for her mother-in-law and a choice for greater life and moving to a place where, even though it wouldn't be easy, she thought she would have a better chance at survival. She chose life, the hard choice, and the strongly loving and life-giving choice, and it worked. Back in Israel, she'd meet Boaz, a rich farmer, and they would have children, and Naomi, the grandmother, would be able to bounce little Obed on her knee. And Obed became the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David, who, along with Ruth, were descendants, direct ancestors of Jesus. Recent studies are extremely interesting, suggesting that the Moabites were the ancestors of the Moors in Africa, northwestern and, southwest, northwestern and western Africa. And the Moors, as you know, are black. So I've seen a picture of Ruth somewhere in my life where she's black. And that would mean that Jesus is mixed race. Going back to the point, but maybe that is a point. It is one of the big points. She chose to be an exile and an alien, an unwanted immigrant who was looked down upon and distrusted. And in so doing, she was choosing to take an enormous risk for love, and that was also for life. 
Ruth and Naomi became two women through whom God tore down long-standing and carefully crafted prejudicial laws and the culture of exclusion. By tradition, the book of Ruth should never have become a book in the Bible. The hero, who's a woman, which in itself is extremely unusual, is not one of the chosen people in the Old Testament, nor part of the chosen people, but she's actually an enemy of the chosen people. Ezra and Nehemiah, who have their own books in the Old Testament, were also or Hebrew scriptures, as we want to call it. The, they were not just judges, which was a really big thing, prophets, but they were also a Persian governor and a Persian commissioner. Uh, so they're politically and religiously leaders. And they were dealing with the Jews who had come back from Babylon, where they intermixed with other foreigners. And so they were trying to get this purity of race and belief. And so they passed all these laws that are in the Hebrew scriptures that said, you cannot marry a person from outside of the chosen people. And if you do, which a lot of them had because they'd come back from Babylon, you need to divorce her and leave her and any of the children in your family that are mixed race. Those were the laws. They left people and they killed people for that. And in the midst of that, we're holding up the book of Ruth, who was a mixed race marriage and has mixed race children. And it's one of the holy books of the Bible. So whoever chose that is saying, this is an agent through whom God worked. This was a holy person. And she was someone that all of us previously and still might think of as enemies. So some of those walls, those religious and political law walls came tumbling down. And so what does that mean to us today in our city and in our state and our country where things are very divided politically and for some people religiously? What does it say about the walls that we have built? Our dividing lines between me and people who are not like me. I think of police and Black Lives Matter. I think of those for whom Biden is a hero and those who really love Trump. I think of anti-vaxxers and vaxxers, those who wear masks and those who don't wear masks, and those who have heart attacks over all of these issues. What if we put our other in place of Ruth? Could our walls come down too? Naomi thought her life was over. She had immigrated to a dangerous land to escape famine, only to have everybody die anyway, and then another famine struck. She was sure God hated her. She said, my life is bitter, and it's because God made it that way. She had no hope, and she wanted a miracle. Now, we could say there's miracles around us all the time. Look at your body. Look at children. Look at birth. Look at death. Look at creation. We know those are miracles, but that's not what Ruth, that's not what Naomi wanted. She wanted a flashbang, bring me back from the dead miracle. She wanted God to swoop in from outside of the situation and make it all different. And that is not what God does very often. But God did do what God usually does. God worked through the reality that she experienced and the love of the people around her. God worked through Ruth and Boaz. Ruth made a huge courageous decision, choosing the possibility of more life over the security of less life. She made a courageous choice out of love rather than a safe choice out of fear. And that is a challenge that we all face. Can we make courageous choices out of love? And that courageous choice might be a daily choice of living in this situation that is hard and working through it. And that is a loving choice. Rather than retreating into a secure, safer choice based on fear. Last winter, I know I shared this story, but it fits, and it's a good story. When Carol and I were victims of an attempted carjacking, and we had taken our car, our, bro, our, my, our son, one of our sons, Tim, needed to borrow a car, so we took, my, took our cars over to his girlfriend's house, parked on the street, it was about seven o'clock at night, on a Sunday evening, and he came out, thanked us, gave him the keys, he kissed us, went back in, I sat, moved over to sit in Carol's car, and my door flung open, and a young man with a gun looked at me and punched me in the eye, and grabbed my keys and my phone and Carol's phone and my purse, including my wallet. 
And at the same time, another guy was struggling with Carol to open her door and grab her purse, and Carol was fighting back, being Carol. <laughs> and I started screaming, and she started laying on the horn and yelling for Tim, and I thought that was ridiculous because Tim was across the street in the house, but actually, he was still on the porch taking off his boots. And so he heard us and came running and yelling. And these four guys, it was the two guys at our door and two guys behind them, these four guys started running. Anne pointed a gun at Tim and yelled at him. And he, turned, he stopped, realizing we were safe, and turned around. So we were OK. I had a concussion. I had a pretty big black eye. But we could have been killed, and our son could have been killed. Our car wasn't taken. Who cares? But you look back and you think, oh my gosh, look what could have happened. And, but what did happen is we called 911, went back to our house, called 911. The police came. They were, very, they were great. They said, can we look in your alley? We said, yes. Our alley is very dark. And these guys had my purse with my wallet and my driver's license with our address and my keys. And a gun, at least one gun. He, so the police said, you know, clearly you got to change your locks, but that's not going to happen. Talk to your neighbor, I mean, right away. Talk to your neighbors. Make sure that if they see anything, they call us right away. So we called our first neighbor next door who said, are you guys safe? And we said, well, yeah, our ex-son-in-law lives with us. And then I thought, wait a minute. What is he going to do? They got my keys. What are they, they going to do if they walk in with guns in the middle of the night? And so our neighbor said, well, you know, I'm an accountant, but I'm an accountant for a uh, hotel. You guys can come stay at our hotel, Best Western, by the airport, free tonight, until you change your locks tomorrow. And then our other neighbor across the way said, you know, if you want to, like, in the future, for the next couple days, put your, your car in my garage, I can park on the street. And then about a week later, a guy called me, and he said, um, my son found your keys in the snowdrift, and you've got a tag on it for LA Fitness. And I called LA Fitness. This is during COVID. You haven't been there, but they still had your phone number. And so I can bring over your keys if you want. And then another guy a week later Facebooked me and said, I'm a pastor at a church in South Minneapolis. And your cards, a bunch of your cards got thrown through my church mail slot. And then another woman called me a week later and said, I've got some more of your cards. One of them had the seminary on it, United Theological Seminary, which I just hadn't taken out for some reason. And I know Laura Kanata, who went to that seminary. So I called her and said, do you know this person? And she gave me your phone number. So these people were strangers for the most part and friends. And the amount of positive care that we got was enormously bigger than the little amount of evil that these guys were putting in the world like way bigger. And they would have not, none of them would have said they did anything spectacular. This would have been the same type of action that you or I would do on a daily basis for somebody. They were not dramatic, but they were dramatic in our lives. And this is the other kind of love that's not courageous sticking to it through really hard times, but that's very real and really affects people and grows and multiplies. And that is, all of that is what Jesus is talking about today. What does this have to do with Halloween? Just about nothing. <laughs> but the story of Ruth and Naomi shows that God does not swoop in to redeem our lives, usually, in a dramatic, amazing way. Although. The situation with an organ transplant, yes, that is a swoop. And it's also a swoop through some people making a really hard, loving choice. And that's all of those choices that they're talking about. This is what love is. It's not the easy frosting on the cake, gosh, romantic stuff, although that's really fun. It's continuing to make choices of love on a daily basis when it's really hard and when it's not so hard, but you see somebody else is really hard. That's what they're talking about. That's how God acts. And that also we can say on this feast of the Eve of all saints, hallowed Eve, Halloween, that this love doesn't die, 
Even the laws of thermodynamics, which my son, the chemistry guy, my other son, Joe, the chemistry guy, would know. Energy is not created or destroyed. It's transformed. And that's, that's what love and we are, too. We are transformed. And that love and our spirits, which is intermingled, doesn't die just because our bodies do. It stays alive. It stays alive mixed with God. It stays alive mixed with other people of loving spirits. How? Who knows? But I believe it stays alive. And that is one of the Christian beliefs, actually. And it is still with us. It does not die. You know, there's three things that last, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I don't take every line of scripture with something that I respect and love. There's a lot of really weird ones in there. But that's one that I do, and I think it's true. The greatest of these is love, and it lasts, and it is profound. Amen. Now let's hear from our great choir again. I love... Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Every day, dear God, every day we're given a chance to spread love, to live into our true self, the true self that connects us to one another, that sees in our story relationships, connections, forgiveness, compassion, and love, and they are greater than anything else. Every day, we have a chance to do that small thing that affects another life, that creates a possibility, that opens our heart for forgiveness. Every day, we get a chance to do something somewhere that draws us closer to you every day. In this holy time, this thin place between life and death where the ancient church calls us to commune to and talk to and, and be part of this communion of saints, this thin place between the spiritual and the natural world where the leaves fall and death welcomes us in, and asks us to be present to its reality. To be present to that which has been true for all time. This thin place of all souls, all saints, all hallows eve. 
gives us the chance to walk with Ruth and Naomi. To have conversations with those who have died, whose spirits still live on. To be present to the grace and truth that understands that death doesn't have the last word, but faith, hope, and love endure forever. These are our prayers for our people who are sick in body, mind, and spirit. They're prayers of joy for those who are traveling to new places to meet new people. Their prayers for families reunited and families still apart. These are the prayers for those sleeping under bridges and in shelters and those in the street that don't feel safe anywhere. These are our prayers for those who struggle with mental illness and wonder where their next kindness is coming from. And can they trust it? These are our prayers. And we combine them in the one prayer you taught us to pray. Our mother and father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. And we respond to that good news with this possibility to give, as Jody so beautifully reminded us, what a wonderful thing it is to find a place that nurtures the whole being, the whole soul. And we give out of gratitude our time, our talents, our resources. And there's so many different ways to give, whether it's loose change or your pledge or whatever uh, you can do to make this a better place. So thank you, thank you for all you give and will give in the future. Amen.
Please stand and join me in the offertory prayer. Our offerings are but one more way to us to give form to our care for others. We give food for food shelves, votes in an election, a kind word to a neighbor, or an act of generosity. Accept our gifts, O God, and multiply them with your grace so that they may fill the world with your love. Amen. Well, saints of God, let's go out there and destroy those walls. Make those loving choices and continue to live the joy and the love that we have for the world. Amen. Thank you. 